So we are ready for okay. Exodus chapter 37. Um, we read a big, last, big chunk last week in 36 and about the construction of the tabernacle. <clears throat> and again, like since we're in the second half of Exodus, where it's kind of just stating how they followed God's instructions, we'll read this a, a section at a time and we'll just keep moving forward. So unless there's any questions or anything we need to bring up before we get started, then let's dive in. Uh, my first section is one through nine. Bezael made the ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half was its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, a cubit and a half its height, and he overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside, and he made molding of gold around it, and he cast for it four rings of gold for its four feet, two rings on its one side and two rings on the other side. And he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold, and put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. And he made a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And he made two cherubim of gold, and he made them of hammered work on the two ends of the mercy seat. One chair on the one end and one chair on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat, he made the cherubim on the on its two ends. The cherubim spread their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, and with their face, with their faces one to another, toward the mercy seat were the faces of the cherubim. Any thoughts or questions? <laughs> He must have been pretty wealthy. Okay. We read last week about how they gave all the gold necessary to make. Yeah, that took a lot of gold. It would have taken a lot of gold. Yeah. So it says a mercy seat at the cover. Where did they get the name mercy seat? <clears throat> so it's essentially the lid to the box. But it's called the mercy seat because God said it was from that spot, that place, that he would interact with humanity moving forward. So it becomes, and for all intents and purposes, um, his throne here on earth. This, the, uh, not so much a seat, though it, it would be a seat, but it's like, think of, we use the term the seat of a person's power. Um, yeah, Melissa's got the, the gift they got me, and so in some ways, they it's referred to almost as his footstool. That this is the place where he stands here on earth. Does that make sense? So it is the seat of God's mercy. Is a place where God gives mercy to the people who come seeking. Make sense? So if the Ark of the Covenant was like that, like a big box, <clears throat> the Noah's Ark, it has goes by the same name, would have looked almost exactly. The word Ark. Whether it's the Ark of the Covenant or Noah's Ark are the exact same words. It's also the same word that's used basically for a coffin. Uh, so it's a box. They, they were all boxes. And Noah's Ark might have had a keel or something like that to keep it upright, but essentially it was just a big floating box. Any other thoughts or questions? Make sure nobody's got anything in the chat. <clears throat> and we'll read the next section. <clears throat> 10 through 16. He also made the table of acacia wood. Two cubits was its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. <clears throat> and he overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding of gold around it. He made a rim around it, a handbreadth wide, 
and made a molding of gold around the rim. He cast for it four rings of gold and fastened the rings to the four corners at its four legs. Close to the framework were the rings as holders of the four poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood to carry the table and overlaid them with gold. And he made the vessels of pure gold that were to be on the table, its plates and dishes for incense, and its bowls and flagons with which to pour drink offerings. <clears throat> any thoughts or questions? Are pretty straightforward. Is there any of these pieces that, I mean, have they survived anything? I mean, gold would last forever. Well, that we know of, technically, no. I mean, of course, there have been conspiracies that the ark has survived and it just remains hidden. Um, of all different kinds of stories about that. But to be honest with you, uh, we know that the ark or that the, the pieces were moved from the tabernacle into the temple when Solomon built the temple. And scripture tells us that when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, all the articles were taken off to Babylon. It also says, I believe in uh, Ezra, that they were allowed to bring them back. Um, you have what's called Hezekiah's temple, the, the second temple. Um, and then Herod re, well, he renews the whole thing. He basically rebuilds it and makes it bigger and grander. But in AD 70, that temple was destroyed by the Romans. And as far as we know from history, the articles are lost at that point. My assumption would probably be that the Romans probably took them and melted them down. But we don't know that. We're also not 100% certain. I've heard a lot of, uh, I've read a couple of things when I was in seminary that they think for certain the Ark of the Covenant came out of Babylon, but whether the other items were melted down then too, and that wealth dispersed, and then they had to start over again when they came back, we really don't know. But as far as we know today, no. Now, there is an, uh, an African tribe in uh, South Africa that claims to be descended from the tribe of Judah uh, when Jeremiah fled and took the, the they claim that they have the Ark of the Covenant with them. Uh, of course, their Ark is more like a big round drum. There's also another group that claims to have the Ark um, in the deserts of Ethiopia. There is a, a, a temple that has been carved out of solid stone. They took a mountain, essentially cleaved off the face of it, carved this church into it, and they claim to have priests. They're, they claim to be from the Jewish line, and no one who isn't part of their group can get within a mile of this place. We just have pictures from a distance of, the, of this. And whether or not it actually contains the ark, we don't know. There are, so there are people groups who claim to have it, but uh, there was also a man who supposedly in the 1930s did some excavating in Jerusalem underneath uh, where Golgotha, where Christ was supposedly crucified. And he claims to have found the ark buried underneath that spot. And But then when they went back to find how he got in there, they couldn't find the entrance. So who knows? <clears throat> um, the, but the ark itself, while all of these tables and the lamp and everything would have been exquisite, the ark itself is always seen as the only, the most important piece, if that makes sense. So they could have lost everything else, but if they kept the ark, they were in good shape. But if they found it and they touched it, they would have died. 
And that was God did. So in the book, in the, the story of Samuel, first thing like Samuel, there is a story where the ark is captured and the Philistines take it off. And everywhere that they put it, they put it in their temple and it causes all kinds of bad things to happen. And so finally they get fed up with it. They're like, we don't want this bad stuff. So they stick it on a cart and they hook it. I think it's an oxen up to the cart and they just say, go. They don't even lead the oxen or anything. And it supposedly goes uh, back to towards the people of Israel. There's a man who finds it and he sends word that he has found it. But when he tries to, to direct it, apparently the, the cart starts to tip over and he goes to grab it. The word says he tries to grasp it for himself. And God strikes him dead. A, and the implication is that he wants to be the, the savior of the ark. He wants to be the one who brought it back to Israel instead of it being God. Chris, uh, Don says pictures of what this table might look like. And Krista says, I agree with Don. Can we see pictures of the table and also how everything was to sit with the bowls and plates? I'll let you look for that. Um, in some ways, this table looks a, was probably a lot like the little table we use for fellowship time where we put the drinks on because it's only a cubit wide. And then it says it's uh, two cubits long. So we're not talking a very big table. Um, it's just a little bit bigger than the heart. Well, and it's not even as big as the heart. So it's as long as the ark is, but the ark is a cubit and a half wide, and this is only a cubit wide. Are they both a cubit and a half tall? Yeah, cubit and a half tall. So about this tall. Um, basically, to be honest with you, this is a table, but we would probably call it an end table or a hall table today. And it's a little tall for a coffee. If it was only a cubit tall, it'd be a coffee table. This is a cubit and a half. It's, you know, it's a little uh, a grand coffee table. They hadn't discovered coffee yet. They hadn't discovered coffee yet. <laughs> um, the drink offering table. When you find them, let, let me know. This is, I, I don't really have a good answer for you, but that's what I can tell you of what little we, we've known of tracking. Um, there are many who question whether or not the ark came back with the second temple. Uh, there are many who wonder if there was ever an ark in the second temple at all. They built another one just as, a, you know, um, but we definitely don't know anything about if it did exist at that point, what happened to it post AD 70. Because Rome basically comes in and they just, they're tired of the Jews. They're like, you're done. They level everything. Well, did they find that ark in the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> 17 through 24. Uh, and if you find the picture, let us know. Okay. Uh, verse 17. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers were of one piece with it. And there were six branches going out of its side. Three branches of the lampstand at one side and three branches of the lampstand out the other side. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with the calyx and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with the calyx and flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand and on the lampstand itself were four cups made like almond blossoms with the ca their calyx and flowers. And the calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out of it. Their calyxes and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole of it was a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. 
and he made and he made it seven lamps and its tongs and its trays of pure gold and he made it and all its utensils of a talent of pure gold the talent is a measure of weight and as soon as i read that i knew someone was going to ask So a talent is about 56.9 pounds of gold. Um, 25.8 kilograms. That's a lot of gold. Gold's what, $1,800 an ounce now? It was cheaper then. <laughs> so is everything else. Yeah. So I did this math the other day. Um, gold is $2,193 an ounce. Or no, a pound. No, an ounce. An ounce. It was $1,800 at Christmas time. Um, the reason I know this is because uh, when I was reading through about the gifts that were given in Leviticus, where it spells out how much each person gave and what the weight of gold, silver, bronze was, I decided to do the math. And uh, they essentially gave $51 million worth of gold, silver, and bronze in today's money. Now, again, there's 3.6 million people. So it's only like 85 bucks a person, but you know. <laughs> well, gold went up $2.80 today. So that's why you have to buy it. <laughs> so if you're talking 21, what did I say, 2176 an ounce? 2193. So. Um, what about gold? <laughs> That's a troy ounce. ounce. 93 times the story ounce. I don't know what the difference is. Troy ounce is uh, 12 ounces to a pound. Okay. Well, that's good to know. 12 ounces to a pound. So we'll take that times 12. And then what I say, 56.9 pounds. So the retail value of the lampstand is $1.497 million. One and a half million dollars worth of gold in that nice little lampstand. So I highly doubt it survived in you. <laughs> just, just saying. Any other? That's a lot of gold. That's a lot of gold. That's a lot of wedding rings. And that's just one piece. And that's all of one piece. That doesn't include overlaying the ark with gold. That doesn't include the altar of incense, which we're, we're going to get ready to talk about. You know, um, that doesn't include overlaying the table with gold. The ring, solid ring. All those rings were solid gold. First of all, I'd hate to be the priest who has to carry a 57 pound yeah. uh, you know, lampstand, solid gold, because she wants to be the guy who's carrying that thing and trips on the rock and bends it. You do it bend it, you know what I mean? Like chip off the blossoms. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? All right, let's finish the chapter. Oh, you do have something now? So those, that's probably fairly accurate. Um, looking at those pieces, those seven pieces there, you can kind of see I, I, the arc is fairly... Uh, what I how I would have described it 
the table of showbread, that's what we just read. That's probably pretty accurate. Like I said, it looks kind of like a long end table. Uh, the golden lampstand, that's probably pretty close. Um, we haven't read about the uh, altar of incense yet this time around. And of course, then the the, the bronze sea or lager or uh, bath, and then the altar of bronze we haven't read about yet this time either. Those are the primary pieces of the tabernacle. So, does that help a little bit? Yeah, I think that does. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, there's that's that's about what I would. I mean, that's. Somebody's taken a wooden table and just kind of painted that, but that's probably pretty close right there. Like I said, it, it makes me think of just a, a little bit wider than a tall table, you know. But it was meant to always have those 12 loaves of bread on it, and it's where they kept the oil for the lamp and the incense for the altar of incense. Okay. And so the lampstand is basically the menorah. Yes. So the difference between the lamp and the menorah is the menorah actually has one more set of branches out. The menorah actually has uh, eight branches instead of just six. Um, and the reason for that is that they, they celebrate the eight nights that God's kept the oil burning in the lamp. So, if that makes sense. It was going to seven. Yes, the temple only had seven, but the menorah actually ends up with nine. Because it, it has, like at this one, you'd have one more set out. Make sense? Okay. I like this. Yeah, seven. That one's got seven. Yep, that one's. This is. These are renditions of what was in the tabernacle in the temple. The menorah that you see today, a lot of times menorahs are made out of silver and not gold, for somewhat obvious reasons, but also uh, to distinguish it as a, not the same thing as the temple's plan. And they would again have one more set of branches. Okay. All right. We'll finish the chapter. 25 through 29. He made the altar of incense of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit and its breadth was a cubit. It was a square and two cubits was its height. Its horns, horns were of one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top, and around its sides and its horns. And he made a molding of gold around it. He made two rings of gold on it under its molding on two opposite sides of it as holders for the poles with which to carry it. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He made the holy anointing oil also and the pure fragrant incense blended as by the perfume. Thoughts or questions? It's the tallest thing in there. It's a half a cubit taller. I mean, you can't make it very big. You need a very big or very tall to be cumbersome and hard to carry. Yeah, there's a level of pragmatics to it that uh, they wouldn't have wanted it very big because it would become cumbersome to carry around. And, um, but by the same token, from everything we've seen, um, about everybody in this room would have been a tall Israelite at this point in time. I think they have been called tall, so. Yeah, Melissa at 5'3 would have been taller than most of the men. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't even know how tall anybody else is, but um, 
we would all be considered pretty tall people compared to what they are. Harry would be most like Goliath. <laughs> getting close. Uh, getting close. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? <clears throat> nice question about uh, perfume. I mean, how would they make perfume out there? I mean, that's. So. It's gotta be an art. I mean, it's gotta be something special. So, somewhere along the way, someone, whether it's Bezael or someone else, had learned those skills or was given that skill by God, the skills of a perfumer and being able to mix things together. But they're not actually making perfume. They're making the incense like I had brought up a few weeks ago, and it's just a mixture of spices. Now, the key difference is, is they would have actually taken it where mine, what I brought in was kind of granular. They would have ground, ground it down to where it would have blended to the point where as they sprinkled it on, it would have been a uniform kind of thing, if that makes sense. Um, and then a lot of times I've seen where they've actually taken it then and they kind of mold it back together into bricks that they can put on the fire for that to burn. Um, it's talking about the skills of a perfumer, not necessarily making perfume. So when they left Egypt, they left in a hurry and they were only supposed to take the clothes on their back and tie them in the clothes. But in the four years, they developed the tools to make all this stuff. So it's not been 40 years. It's actually, we're at less than a year okay. at this point. From them leaving Egypt. Not all these tools to be so when it talks about leaving with the clothes on your back, mm -hmm. um, back at the beginning in, in uh, what is that, chapter 14 or 15, um, it's talking about the readiness with which to leave. It's mm -hmm. not saying that they left everything else behind. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, they were told. You're not coming back, and you need to leave in a hurry. So they would only bring the things that they felt were absolutely necessary. So if someone had the skills of a perfumer, they probably would have brought the tools of their trade. Um, because again, their, the assumption is, is that they're going to go and immediately settle in another land. And so they want to be able to set up shop and do everything that they are used to being able to do. It, God wasn't making them leave everything behind. Because in fact, he actually says, go to the Egyptians and ask them for goods. And they will, and you know, they plundered Egypt. Um, they actually took a lot of the goods with them. But again, you, you wouldn't, like I highly doubt there's anybody taking around a mobile forge with them. <laughs> You know, they would have taken the skills to make the forge. They, I highly doubt anybody is taking around a mobile oven, but they would have known how to make those and be ready to set up shop. The things that could be moved, their tools, their implements, all those kind of things, I'm certain that they took with them. Um, but most of, if, if it wasn't mobile, they left that behind. Make sense? Any others? Well, let's keep going. 38, um, one through seven. He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia. Five cubits was its length and five cubits its breadth. It was square and three cubits was tight. He made horns for it on its four corners. Its horns were of one piece with it. And he overlaid it with bronze, and he made all the utensils of the altar, the pots, the doubles, the basins, the forks, and the fire pans. He made all its utensils of bronze, and he made for the altar an engraving, a network of bronze under its ledge, extending halfway down. He cast four rings on the four corners of the bronze grating as holders for the pots. 
He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. <coughs> he put the poles through the rings on the sides of the altar to carry it with him. He made it hollow with boards. Okay. Want to run out of boards? <laughs> um, I think we had this conversation before uh, when. When God was describing mm -hmm. it the first time, that bronze has a much higher melting point. Mm -hmm. And since this would be using to cook all the offerings, um, you probably want it out of something a little more sturdy than like gold that has a lower melting point and becomes malleable as it gets warm. Mm -hmm. So there's a pragmatic reason. I mean, bronze would still look very pretty, but any other thoughts or questions? Verse eight's pretty easy. He made the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting. Ask the question. <laughs> I don't understand how I can make something up. So understand, mirrors at this point in time were not made of glass. A mirror was a polished sheet of metal. Uh, that's part of the reason why, if you think about that uh, passage in Scripture that we see now as in a mirror in our mirrors today are actually very, very high quality. Um, you ever seen a, a stainless steel skillet that was so clean you could see a reflection in it? Uh, that's the kind of thing you're talking about. So the mirrors were as smooth a piece of solid metal as you could get. And so these mirrors happen to be made of bronze. And they took the mirrors that these ladies had used for their own personal beautification. <laughs> I was trying to think of something judicious to say. And then <laughs> used them to make this basin which there's some neat symbolism in that. Because the basin was used actually at the place where they would wash themselves. And so these items which were meant to show beauty, show beauty through the washing away of sin. Does that make sense? Oh, well, it's shiny. Made it into a basin, you could still see your reflection in there, even with the water. And with the water on top, you could probably see even better. But it was the place where the priests came and washed themselves as they offered the sacrifices. During the Americas, the Chilean people had lamps, like wall lamps, but they had this shiny thing, the shield behind it. Mm -hmm. My grandmother had. She wasn't early colonial, but uh, it, 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 born in the mid 1800s. So, you know, they that was a treasured thing for the family. I think some of the siblings ordered or argued over it. But mm. My mother didn't get it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's some of what we we have to think about because what we think of a, of as a mirror is less than 150 years old, really. That's relatively new technology. Um, and now we make mirrors dirt cheap and they're, eh, dime a dozen, which is actually where the whole superstition of breaking a mirror causes seven years of bad luck because they were really expensive. Probably would take seven years to save the money to buy a new one. Back, right? A lot of times, yeah. Those the older mirrors were silver or lead. Um, 
Of course, that's definitely not healthy for you, but anything else? All right, nine through 20, making the court. And he made the court for the south side, the hanging of the court were the fine twine linen and a hundred cubits. Their 20 pillars and their 20 bases were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the north side, there were hangings of a hundred cubits. Their 20 pillars and their 20 bases were of bronze, but the hooks the, of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the west side were hangings of 50 cubits. Their 10 pillars and their 10 bases, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the front, the east, 50 cubits. The hangings for one side of the gate were 15 cubits, and their, with their three pillars and three bases. And so for the other side, both on both sides of the gate of the court were hangings of 15 cubits, with their three pillars and their three bases. All the hangings around the court were of fine twine linen, and the bases for the pillars were of bronze. But the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. The overlaying of their capitals was also of silver, and all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. And a crop and the screen for the gate of the court was embroidered with needlework in blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine twine linen. It was 20 cubits long and five cubits high in its breadth, corresponding to the hangings of the court. And all the pillars were four in number. Their four bases were of bronze, their hooks of silver, and the overlay of their capitals and their fillets of silver, and all the pegs for the tabernacle for the court all were of bronze, all around were of bronze. Why the difference, bronze to silver, and silver to bronze, when this is no heat? So I think to a certain degree, bronze are talking about weight. Um, if you were to take and make a stand to put a pole in, and you had three stands of equal size and shape, but one was of bronze, one was of silver, and one was of gold. The bronze one would weigh the most. Silver was also softer, wasn't it? Silver would often be softer and much more pliable. Uh, but again, there's this kind of, so I think that some of it is pure pragmatics. So having the bronze base would give them more strength to hold up these walls. I mean, essentially, we're talking about walls of cloth. Um, most of you, I'm sure, have done this at some point in time or another, but hung a, a sheet out on the line to dry. Blanket board. What? A blanket board. Or a blanket, blanket board, yeah. Um, but I, I want to use specifically the notion of a sheet on the line. That's Typically, the laundry lines were only about five to twelve gram, right? They weren't very high, and that sheet you wanted to stretch it out so that it would dry as quick as possible. But think of a sheet that is taller than our walls, okay? And it's all connected, and it's bigger. It's about a little bit bigger than this room, okay? Mm -hmm. And now you've got the winds of the desert blowing against it. So those bases needed to be very heavy in order for them to hold those poles so that when the rope was pulled tight, this whole thing wouldn't just whip and blow and rip in the wind. That make sense? By the same token, there is this notion of the most holy things are gold in the center. You have gold in the center, and the further out you go to silver and bronze. Do you get what I'm saying? There's this notion of the closer you get to God, the more opulent it is.
Make sense? Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. And then let's finish the chapter. Second chapter. Cruising now. 21 to 31. These are the records of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony as they were recorded at the commandment of Moses, the responsibility of the Levites under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest, Beziel, the son of Ur, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. And with him, with him Aholabab, the son of Ashimach of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer and embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine twine linen. All the gold that was used for the work in all the construction of the sanctuary, the gold from the offering, was 29 talents and 730 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary. The silver from those of the congregation who were recorded was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary. A becca a head, that is half a shekel by the shekel of the sanctuary <clears throat> for everyone who was listed in the records from 20 years old and upward for 603,550 men. The 100 talents of silver were for casting the bases of the sanctuary and the bases of the veil. The silver were for a uh, hundred bases for the hundred talents, a, hundred, a talent a base. And of the 1,775 shekels, he made the hooks for the pillars and overlaid their capitals <clears throat> and made the fillets for them. The bronze that was offered was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. With it, he made the bases for the entrance of the tent of meeting, the bronze altar, and the bronze grating for it and all the utensils of the altar, the bases around the tent and the bases of the gate of the court, all the pegs of the tabernacle and all the pegs around the court. That's where I got the numbers from and I did the math before. And again, just the value of the precious metals in today's money would be $51 million. <laughs> That does not include any of the, the cloth, uh, the, 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 the linens, the, the ram skins that were put over the top. Um, doesn't include any of the rope that was given to, you know, to tie everything down. So it's probably pretty safe to say, who wants to build a sanctuary for $55 million? They could draw some people. <clears throat> Definitely not hiding in the wilderness, is it? <laughs> Any thoughts or questions? Then they had to move it too, right? It had to be highly portable, very good. Yes. First of all, 56.9 pounds. I would hate to be the person who has to carry around the, that. Or each of the bases. Set basically 57 pounds of bronze. One person is probably just carrying one. That's glad I'm not a part of that Levite tribe. Wouldn't want to move very far, would it? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's why, you know, when you start thinking about the pragmatics of this, we we tell the story, you know, we're not there yet at this point, but we tell the story as if they wandered in the wilderness. I get the impression they probably wandered for a week or two and then sat down for nine months. <laughs> and then they wandered for a week or two and then they sat down for a couple of years. And then they wandered for a week or two. I don't get the impression that they just for 40 years were doing this. Because, I mean, that would actually be really punishment. <laughs> Yeah. 
just read something about they spent a year here? And yeah, and here? at the end of numbers, and in, uh, it goes into greater detail about how long they spent in each place. But yeah, I think wandering over the course of 40 years, yes, that's exactly what they did. But day in, day out, they probably didn't move very often. I mean, it takes a whole lot to set up camp and to get find places for all your herds and make sure all the animals get fed and watered. And then you got to collect, got to collect that manna every morning. And, and you know, then there's all those sacrifices that still have to be done every day. And, you know, I, I just don't think that they moved as much as we imply. But by the same token, I would also say that God's wandering they never got to stay in one place long enough for where that it ever felt like it was home. You know, no, not, no, that they, were supposed to go there. they knew that they were supposed to go there, and when they said no, and God said, okay, then. So, you know, it's been nine months here, and 12 months there, and six months here, and a year and a half there, and, you know, they there's an intentionalness that God's like, you didn't want what I wanted to give you, so you're not going to have one. Sort of like being in the army or something. Pretty much, yeah. I'm surprised Madison didn't make some kind of comment about being a preacher's kid or something. <laughs> Madison did say uh, that sheet will get dirty really quick with all that sand. Um, Amy. Uh, and you could pack it all up and take it with you. That's right. It was meant, that's why it was made in pieces so that, you know, it could be packed up. Um, this wasn't meant to be permanent, except it was supposed to last a really long time. That's really good cloth if it lasts 40 years in the desert. Well, I was just reading one of the devotions for this week, and it was saying Moses was telling the people, Well, your sandals didn't wear out in that 40 years, or you didn't get blisters on your feet, or something like that. Right. And so I suppose the, all the stuff in the tabernacle lasts 40 years, too, or more. Or more, a whole lot more. In fact, um, if, if we get We'll go get there. I just don't know how long it will take us to get there. But if we move out of out of Judges, Joshua and Judges and Ruth, and we get into Samuel, this very same tabernacle is standing, and it's the one that Samuel is taken to when he serves underneath Eli. And depending on how you do the math. Uh, it's over 400 years old. Because we, like I said, I estimate that this was about 1467 BC and the temple is built in about uh, 960 BC under Solomon. David starts to rule in 1000 BC. 1,104, somewhere in there. And Samuel anoints David as king. So the tabernacle that David goes to is probably more than, I mean, it, it might have been repaired along the way, but it's essentially the exact same tabernacle 400 plus years later. Beziel and Aholabab have some really good craftsmanship skills, don't they? <laughs> There's also that whole little thing you're getting at, Kay, where you know God's probably helping you along. But you know. Any other thoughts? Oh boy. The next section is long. Okay. Let's read chapter 39. The whole thing. It's on making the priestly garments. 
From the blue and purple and scarlet yarns, they made finely woven garments for ministering in the holy place. They made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the ephod of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. And they hammered out gold leaf and cut it into threads to work into the blue and purple and scarlet yarn and into the fine twine linen and its skilled design. They made for the ephod attached shoulder pieces joined to it at its two edges. And the skillfully woven band on, on it was of one piece with it and made like it of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine twine linen as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold filigree and engraved like the engravings of a signet, according to the names of the sons of Israel. And, they, and he set them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod to be stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the breastpiece in skilled work in the style of the ephod of the blue, purple, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. It was square. They made the breastpiece double, a span its length and a span its breadth when double. And they set it in four rows of stones. A row of sardis, topaz, and carbuncle was the first row. The second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jason, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold filigree. There were 12 stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They were like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. And they made they made on the breastpiece twisted chains like cords of pure gold. And they made two settings of gold filigree and two gold rings and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece. And they put the two cords of gold and the two rings at the edge of the breastpiece. They attached the two ends of the two cords to the two settings of the filigree. Thus they attached it in the front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Then they made two rings of gold and put at the two ends of the breastpiece on its inside edge next to the ephod. And they made two rings of gold and attached them in the front to the lower parts of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod as it seemed above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they bound the, the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the ephod with the, a lace of blue so that it should lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and that the breastpiece should not be removed from the ephod as the Lord had commanded Moses. He also made the robe of the ephod woven of all blue, and, and the opening of the robe in it was like the opening in a garment around the opening so that it might not tear. On the hem of the robe, they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine twine linen. They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around the hem of the robe, between the pomegranates. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe for ministry, as the Lord had commanded Moses. They also made the coats woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons, and the turban of fine linen, and the caps of fine linen, and the linen undergarments of tw fine twine linen, and the sash of fine twine linen, and of blue and purple and scarlet yarns, embroidered with needlework as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made a plate for the holy crown of pure gold, and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And they tied it to a cord of blue to fasten it on the turban above, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases, and covered the tan ram skins and goat skins, and the veil of the stream, the Ark of the Testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table with all its utensils and the bread of the presence, the lampstand of pure gold and its lamps 
with the lamp set and all its utensils and the oil for the lights, the gold altar, the anointing oil and fragrant incense, and the screen for the entrance of the tent, the bronze altar, its its grating, uh, grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its basins, its bases, and the screen for the for the gate of the tabernacle. For the tent of meeting, the finely worked garments for the ministering of the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons for their service as priests. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all that work. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it. As the Lord had commanded, so they had done it. Then Moses blessed them. Feels redundant, doesn't it? We were told how to do it, we told they did it, and then we're told they did it. But after, while Moses was being told what they needed to do, and they made the silly golden calf, well, what I like to remind people is we needed to understand that after they messed up, they actually went back and did what God commanded them to do as He commanded them to do it. And that it was recorded that they actually did it to the end. Or the committee did it. The committee did it, yeah. Okay. I mean, everybody else brought their parts and did what needed to be done, and they brought their offerings, and the people who were skilled to do it did it. But for once, for once, People obeyed God. Any thoughts? Well, they weren't lazy people. They're busy with the bees. Verse 40. Oh, Don, are you bringing that up again? <sighs> sea cows. <laughs> ah. Explain. Michael says porpoise. Porpoise, sea cows, hand ram skins. Yeah, we had this conversation. Um, What's on this one? Yeah, that's that's probably a decent rendition of what the tabernacle itself would look like. So you got the 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 poles in their bases. You got the 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 covering, and then they have this. This uh, ram skid dried, dried red uh, that would kind of be the, the protection over it. And then you've got the sea cows, manatees, dungongs, whatever it was. We, we had this discussion that they estimate that some uh, breeds of this particular animal could have been like whales and may have been big enough that they only needed one to cover the whole town. But I thought they were in the middle of the desert. They came from Egypt. <laughs> they brought whales with them. <laughs> Someone apparently knew that God was going to ask it, so they brought one giant sea cow skin. I don't know why we needed it, but I, were, I just saw it and I had to have it. Oh. <laughs> and that went away a lot. Yes. What? Oh, I was trying to read it. Fine twine linen, goat hair, red skins dyed red, or ram skins dyed red, and then it says sea cows, manatee, or dungong skins. So the, the sea cow would have made a water resistant. Essentially, that's that's the point it's trying to make. Whether it's uh, sea cows, it's some kind of hide that would have made it water resistant is the point. Which would help it to last the 400 plus years until they finally built the temple. Of course, I'm not for sure that leather out in these elements for 400 years would last that long. Or smell very good. Or smell very good. <laughs> 
be very tough. We have 18 minutes. You want to finish the book? Well, there's actually two sections. Chapter 40, we're going to do 1 through 33. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and you shall put in it the ark of the testimony, and you shall screen the ark with the veil, and you shall bring in the table and arrange it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. And you shall put the golden altar um, for incense before the ark of the testimony, and set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. And you shall set up the court all around it, and hang up the screens for the gate of the court. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it, and consecrate it and all its furniture, so that it may become holy. You shall anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. Then you shall bring all the anoint all. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water and put on Aaron the holy garments and you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest. You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father that they may serve me as priests and their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their, their generations. This Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him, so, so he did. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle, he laid its faces, and it set up its frames, and put it in its poles, and raised up its all pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle, and put the covering on the tent over the tent, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above it on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and arranged the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of the meeting opposite of the table on the south side of the tabernacle. And he set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put in the place the screen up for the door of the tabernacle. And he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offerings and the grain offerings as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put the water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they had went into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. So it's been from the time that they left, it was about a month or so, about 40 days till he got to Mount Sinai. They had the first set of 40 days with Moses up there receiving the, all of these instructions. He comes down, we have the incident with the golden calf. He goes back up, we get a second 40 days of him up there, uh, comes back down, and then they spend the rest of the first year constructing this thing. And on the first day of the first month of the second year, Moses sets it up. They're still at the base of Mount Sinai. <laughs> well, 
What do you think? Was it supposed to be up permanently, or is that just a temporary and then they back down again? Oh, it's <laughs> temporary because they're not going to stop flowing in the promised land. But they got to finally set it up. That he set it up. Do you think he just said, here, you do this, and you do this? He wasn't going to do all I would say he probably did most of the work himself to show the the priests and the Levites, because he's the only one who actually saw it, remember? God, it says God showed it to Moses what it looked like. Well, he had to have a lot of help because he can't handle that side of the tarp. Probably, I'm sure he had some help, but the point is that God told Moses to do it. Moses oversaw the work and Moses made sure that it got done. And at least the first time, Moses was the one in charge of setting this up. Other thoughts or questions? No, it's not like a pop-up camp. Yeah, it's not a pop-up. It's definitely not a pop-up camp. I, I was thinking of that as I was reading it uh, when we took our trip out to uh, Yellowstone, my parents bought a, a camper that had, you know, the slide outs and everything else. And the first time they got it and they slid it up, everything out, and they had everything set up in the front of their yard, and they had to send us a picture. Look at, look at what we got. The excitement of that. And then, of course, as we went camping, and then for whatever reason, sometimes the slides didn't want to work properly, and by the end of it, one slide wouldn't work at all, and you know, there's frustration of, but in this moment, everything is set up. Everything has been done the way God told them to do it. Moses has set everything up. They have consecrated Aaron and his sons and the priests. They have anointed the tabernacle. Everything is in its place. The story's not done. Last section, 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of me, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of me because the cloud settled on him. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, wherever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And they lived happily ever after. Why was Moses not able to enter just because of the cloud? So Moses was originally, in my estimation, he was originally supposed to be the high priest. He was the one who was supposed to speak on behalf of God. But if you remember back at the beginning of the story, he told God, I don't speak no good. Right? And so therefore, the moment Moses has done his duty, he has helped them to build it. He has consecrated this. He has fulfilled the setting of this up. And the moment God descends on that tabernacle, Moses is no longer allowed in. And Aaron, who is anointed and consecrated for the task of speaking to God on behalf of the nation of Israel, now he's the one. Goes in. Moses still is the political leader. He's still the judge, but he no longer, from this point forward, ever functions as their priest. So only the priests were allowed in. Once it was set up and built, only the priests were allowed in, and only the high priest was allowed in. 
to the Holy of Holies. And so Moses, who's shown all this, he gets to show him how to do it. And then he's, he's turned away. What? You said that's a bummer. <laughs> it is a bummer. It, it's, there's a sadness to it. On the one hand, you have this great joy for the people of Israel as a whole. This is one of their most triumphant moments. As excited as they were when they crossed the Red Sea, this is ten times more glorious. Because God is now dwelling amongst them. And what should have been Moses' highest point is the end of his era. Because from this point forward, he is their leader, but he is no longer their spiritual. We better be careful what we say to God, huh? You better be really careful what you say to God, because He takes the, our promises literally. What's that? I said, be careful of those souls. <laughs> This whole book, outside of Moses' early life, takes place over no more than about a year and a half at most. You have the, the prelude, that's Moses' birth and his upbringing, and then you have the meat of it, like I said, at most two years max. From the time Moses is sent back to go pull the people out of it, out of Egypt, and all of that, um, two years. And I don't know how many sessions we've had on the Book of Exodus, but it feels like it's been a journey. <laughs> things I didn't understand. I hope that it has done that for everyone. I know it's done it for me. I've learned a lot these last months. Gosh, I thought you already knew it. When you stopped. <laughs> I know a lot, Jim, but I don't know everything. But luckily, as God's Word tells us, the Holy Spirit will dwell amongst you and he will teach you everything that you need to know. The need to know. Yes, but I want to push a little bit against that because the other side of it is, is we often don't know because we don't ask. We just assume it's over our head, beyond our pay grade, and we just let it go. But this is God's revealed word. God wants us to know it because God wants us to know him. And so none of this is really meant to be secretive. But we have to seek the Holy Spirit if we're going to understand So as we wrap up the book of Exodus, what's been your highlight and what's the question do you still feel yourself lingering? How did they get that gold thread out of the sea? How did they weave the gold thread in amongst the other yeah. threads? And... Yeah. And what did those look like? Well we'll, well, we'll get pictures of it when we get there, that's for sure. I think for me, the unique detail work mm -hmm. that was prescribed for all this stuff is just beyond imagination. Especially in the day, back in that yeah. day. Looking to see 
it looks like we had we've had 28 weeks in the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. I've done my math correctly. First part of Exodus uh, was uh, 11 weeks. Then we had the law code section, which was seven weeks. And now we're on part 10 of this last section, mm -hmm. being with God. So 28 weeks. You feel like you've accomplished something? Yeah. yeah. Because I've read the Bible before, but I sure didn't hear all of this and understand it. I mean, mm -hmm. I can people say, well, I've read the Bible 10 times. And I thought, well, you know, this may be, I've read it, but this may be the first time I've understood it all. You know, this, this had to be a big relief to Moses to get this done and to think that he has accomplished this. And because he really worked at it. You know, yeah, the other side of that, as much as I think of the disappointment side, Moses has finally, he's not in control, he's not in charge of this anymore. It's not his thing. He gets to hand it off to Aaron. Aaron Priest, go for it. This is your deal now. I'll do my thing. You guys stay here. But, but he has led them to, out of Egypt. He's led them to the mountain of God. He has finally got them to agree to live God's way. And he's led them to complete the task of building the tabernacle so that God would dwell amongst them. He's done good. Had he? Yeah. He doesn't get to be the high priest. He, he's lost a little bit. But realistically at this point, Moses is at I give him a solid A minus. Yeah. He didn't have to carry that 50 pound candlestick. <laughs> <laughs> and Moses definitely doesn't carry the 50 pound candlestick. Any other final thoughts before we close out? Anybody online got anything? Next week, we will move into Leviticus. And if you thought the end of Exodus was a slog, we'll have some fun with Leviticus. We're getting into that law code stuff again. There are no other thoughts or questions, then let's break. <coughs> God of us all, your love never fails. Lord, just as you longed to dwell amongst your people back then, so you long to dwell amongst and even in us now. Lord, may we know the joy that came with that first worship service of your tabernacle dwelling here and you amongst your people. Lord, may we live in that kind of joy. And Lord, may we truly follow you and do just as the words say that they did just as you had commanded to Moses. May we do that and more as you have commanded through your son, Jesus. Lord, may we truly live as Israel, those who wrestle with God. And Lord, may we glorify you by all that we say and do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Another question. Yes. So only the priests were in this tent area. The tent part, not the courtyard, but the tent itself. So everybody else was outside. they have been in the courtyard for outside. Of the there was how many seats? Tens of thousands. Well, there was at least 603,000 fighting men, plus all their wives and children and the non-fighting men. So they were all there to worship. They couldn't begin to hear what was going on. 
I think it's called Numa Speakers, the Wind of the Holy Spirit. Or actually, I guess that's Greek. It'd be Ruach, the word, the Hebrew word for spirit. That's as big a miracle as the loaves of bread. They they paid a whole lot more attention, and when they told the story, they didn't play the telephone game. <laughs> Where the story of this end is not the story of that end. Well, thank you all for this journey. It has been a lot of fun. Um, it feels like it's been a slog but at times, but it has been neat to discover this book with you all. And next week, we take a new journey and we move into Leviticus. So you all have a wonderful evening. And if I don't see you before or on Sunday, then I'll see you next week. God bless. Thank you. You're welcome. Would you like the chair staff? No. Nope. It's okay for you. <laughs>